Okay. All right. Well, I'm going to be speaking from this microphone. You have to improvise these days. Um, so let me go ahead and start again. So welcome everybody tonight to our second session of our new Jewish World Travel Group. Last week we were in Mumbai and had the pleasure to connect to Nisam and the community, various community members of the Mumbai JCC. But today we're going to be going now to the southwestern coast, southern southwest coast of India to Cochin. We'll also be visiting um, uh, Delhi, and we're here joined by Leia Elias and also Abhijit Chowdhury. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. So why don't we go ahead and jump in? I'm going to start by reading Leia's profile. Leia was, Leia was also born in Kerala, India. She earned a bachelor's degree in English literature and communication and a master's degree in public relations and corporate communication. She began her professional career working in public relations. She's an active member of the Jewish community in Mumbai, where she credits JDC and the JCC for bringing the community together. She has been an active member in the Jewish Youth Pioneers Program, JYP. Leah was a program co uh, coordinator with Gabriel Project Mumbai and currently an active volunteer in the project. Presently, she works as a security officer in Alal Israeli Airlines. With that said, I'm gonna go ahead and introduce Leah. I'm also gonna try and share a video. Um, can you please let me know if the, um, there's any issues with the sound? One second. sound. There we go. So along with um, along with this, what we're going to go ahead and do is show um, so uh, all right, why don't I go ahead? And I will try and share the video after Leia speaks when she talks about her father. Um, why don't you go ahead and start while I figure out this technical challenges. Thank you, Leia, for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you, Leah, for, for uh, lunch. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, so I will start with a little bit of history of the Cochini Jews, uh, the Kerala Jews in India. The history of Cochini Jews or the Kerala Jews date back to the King Solomon's era, where they had the trade relationship with the Malabar coast, which is the name of the coast in uh, Kerala. And they used to have trade relationship in terms of uh, exchange of uh, spices, animals, clothes, uh, you name it, everything. And uh, after the destruction of uh, the first temple, uh, when the Babylonians took uh, the Jews to Babylonia, since they knew the sea route, they escaped from Babylonia and they landed in Malabar coast, which is, the, which is Kerala. And uh, they started their settlement here. When they started their settlement, the Maharaja of Cochin uh, greeted them with an open arm. He provided them with money and land since they didn't have anything with them. Uh, so they started their life in Kerala and they were living here peacefully until the Portuguese uh, landed here. And uh, when the Portuguese establishment started in the 1500s, that's when uh, they started discriminating against the Jews. Even though they were doing trade with the Jews, they used to discriminate the Jews. So, uh, because of which the Maharaja of Cochin helped them from this discrimination and they asked the Portuguese to leave the land because they were uh, not behaving with the Jews properly. Um, since, they were so, uh, since the Jews were so good in trades and everything, they were exempted from taxation and they were giving, given all the privileges that the Maharaja used to enjoy. Um, and following the expulsion from Iberia in 1492, um, 
there were a few families of Sephardic Jews who came and who settled here uh, in uh, Cochin uh, in the 16th century. They became to known as the Paridesi Jews. Since they came, they came with money. They didn't have to struggle with anything. They were rich enough to build their own houses and everything. And uh, they started uh, living here. Um, uh, and in the late 19th century, a few Arabic speaking Jews who became to known as the Baghdadi also migrated to the Southern India and they joined the Paradisi community. Uh, the centrality of the relationship between the Cochini Jews and Indian rulers were uh, uh, codified on a set of copper plate granting the community with special privileges. The plate, these plates were inscribed in uh, 379 CE in which gave permission for Jews to live freely, build synagogue, own property without any condition attached in a poetic way, as long as the world and the moon exist. The oldest known gravestone of Cochini Jew is written in Hebrew and dates back to 1269 uh, CE. And it's near, right near the Chenamangalam synagogue, one of the oldest synagogue in India. Over the years, the Cochini Jews developed a dialect called Judo Malayalam dialect. Also, they made folk, folk songs, uh, songs uh, for all occasion, whether it's a marriage or festival, and even made songs for crowning of the new king of Cochin. And also, uh, over the years, even though we are living in the 21st century, we felt discrimination within the community itself between the Malabari and the Cochini Jews. The Malabari Jews are the ones who landed from the Babylonia and the Paradisi Jews are from, uh, the Bag from Baghdad as well as Iberia. And uh, they discriminated us uh, based on our skin color. Since we, we are a little, uh, uh, what do you call, a uh, wheatish color, uh, they call us uh, black Jews and, uh, and they were called themselves as white Jews. Uh, till now, we do face the discrimination with the fact that whenever somebody asks them how many Jews are there, they do say that there are only two Jews left, but actually there are 17 Jews in uh, Kerala who do exist. Uh, till the time they didn't find Minyan, they didn't allow the uh, Malabari Jews to enter their synagogues, which is the Paradesi, the Kadavambagam synagogue and Tekambagam synagogue in, in, the, uh, in Fort Cochin, in Matancheri area. Um, but now they do allow us because they want Minyan for their prayers and everything. Um, as you can see in the video, there are a lot of, uh, uh, you can see the attire that the people used to wear here in uh, Cochin when they were here. Uh, you, uh, this is a video from the Paradesi synagogue where they are uh, praying during the Sefer Torah where we take the Sefer Torah outside the synagogue and we uh, take it around uh, the synagogue. Um, also, the specialty of Cochini Synagogue, which, is, which you can't find anywhere uh, in the world except where in Spain and in uh, Israel, is that there are two bimas. One bima which is downstairs and one bima which is upstairs. One bima, uh, why upstairs? Because of the fact that it is believed that in Beta Bikdash, the Torah was read on an elevated platform. So because of that, they, uh, uh, the bima which is there upstairs is, um, has a lot of significance in terms of uh, the uh, Beta Mikdash. And also it's one of like really important thing for uh, ladies to appreciate uh, uh, the keeping of the customs and traditions of the ladies, they sit upstairs. So for them to hear Torah clearly, 
they have kept the bima upstairs as well so all the main prayers happens upstairs and shabad prayer prayers happen downstairs but main uh, mostly main of the uh, main prayers happen upstairs um if i can share uh, my screen with you dia if you can uh, make me as a host i can uh, show you the structure of a cochini synagogue hello dia ओके सो करंटली देर आर सेवन सिनेगॉग्स इन केरला देर यूज टू बी मोर देन सेवन सिनेगॉग्स इन केरला एंड द थ्री सिनेगॉग्स is been take looked after by the government of uh, kerala uh, they have taken it under the heritage department project where they have renovated it since it was left uh, with the government itself but it was not looked after in a, a, a good state um, the commu- uh, uh, the government has taken up under the heritage department and they have renovated three synagogues by themselves Did you see that I was able to make you co-host? Yes. Okay, perfect. Can you see the screen? Yes, we can. Okay, perfect. So yeah, the the cochini jews how they used to look like what they used to wear um they used to wear the local traditional clothes that people here used to wear uh it's basically like the munda and the blouse basically a blouse over it and munda is basically a long yard cloth which is wrapped around uh, your waist um even my granny used to wear the same thing till she was here uh as i told you there are two beamers as number 4 is the one beamer which is downstairs and number 7 which is the beamer upstairs and the ladies uh, uh, area seating area is divided with a screen which is 9 and 10 and 6 are the ladies area where the ladies sit um, all these synagogues face um, the wailing wall it is built on that uh, in that uh, structure and also all the synagogue have 10 um, windows which represents uh, the 10 commandments and there are two bimas when you enter the uh, not bima uh, two um, pillars when you enter the synagogues that represents the two guards which was there in the uh, uh, first and the second temple you have the synagogue which is the ba- mala synagogue it's also one of the oldest synagogue currently uh, it's been taken after uh, looked after by the heritage department which they are renovating by themselves all the remains have been taken to israel and uh, they have put it in one of the synagogues in israel uh, there are different opinions uh, by the historians when the mala synagogue were built uh, according to uh, one of the dravidian judaist uh, and a historian uh, because of a folk song which was sung by the jewish people here it, it is uh, they say that it was built on the 11th century um, the first structure was dismantled during the 14th century due to unknown reason it, there there were there are synagogues which were rebuilt renovated 
dismantled because of uh, them uh, getting on fire. And also the uh, Mala Jewish Cemetery, um, it's very much in uh, the news right now because of the fact that the local government is taking over to build a stadium over it. And the uh, local historians are fighting for it. So the dispute is still going on the court. Uh, this is the Parur Synagogue, which was the first uh, heritage museum uh, by the uh, Kerala government, which was taken up and it's been renovated by them. As you can see, everything is being rebuilt as it was uh, before. And it is now open to the uh, uh, public to go and see. Next. Wait a second. Yeah, this is the Chenamangalam synagogue where I was telling you the oldest gravestone. Uh, this is the gravestone in front of the synagogue itself. Uh, this is also one of the synagogues which is being looked after by the government and also being restored in the same way um, as it used to be. This is the Tekkenbagam synagogue which one of the family, uh, family looks after it. And uh, it's situated in the main city of Ernakulam. Uh, there are like few synagogues which has a similar name itself. There was a synagogue in uh, Matanjari where the Pardesi synagogue was there. Uh, it's uh, now uh, nowhere to be found because it was sold when they had made Alia. And um, now it's turned to be an antique shop and in future it will be a hotel. This is what we got to know. Uh, this is the Paradisi, the famous Paradisi synagogue as everybody knows. Um, as you can see how uh, it is uh, on the right hand side, it, uh, uh, it's the decoration that is done during Simatora uh, with all the parakeet uh, hanging uh, on the walls. It's very beautiful to see during the Simatora festival. Um, this is one of the synagogues which is functional. There is one more synagogue which is uh, currently functional. This is the synagogue, uh, Kadumbagam synagogue, which my father looks after. Uh, how it was before and how it is now on the right hand side, as you can see. Um, this is also one of the functional synagogue where Torah was brought into December 2018. And uh, there are uh, prayers ha happening during high holidays. Uh, so anybody who wants to visit during high holidays are always welcome to the synagogue. And this was the only synagogue where there was a golden Sefer Torah, which is now in uh, uh, Nevatim uh, Synagogue uh, in Israel. And yes. This is also... Uh, another synagogue called Kadumbagal Synagogue, same syn uh, name which was there in the previous uh, uh, synagogue. This synagogue is actually uh, located a few meters away from the Paradesi synagogue itself. Um, the remains of all these uh, synagogues were at, is in the Israeli Museum in Jerusalem. Uh, so all the remains were taken to the Israeli Museum and the person who sold it to the local was a Jew itself. Uh, when he sold it, it was in such a state that it's quite imagin uh, unimaginable. And how it is right now is that one of the portion has been um, fallen down because of the rains and non-maintenance. It was used as a cow shed uh by one of the person now the government has given them the money and they have taken it up on themselves to restore it so this is the one of the least, latest uh synagogue which the government is taking it up as you can see the uh, how the cochini jews used to dress up as i told you 
uh, on the left hand side on the extreme left as you can see it is the attire where the bride and the groom used to wear during their wedding and it is uh, mostly embroidered with gold real gold and uh, this is how they used to look like my granny used to wear the same you wore the same uh, attire when she got married and it was told that uh, my grandfather came on uh, on an elephant uh, when he uh, came for, to get married uh, this uh, above is the um uh is the other uh, is the community in israel who still who is still there who still sings uh, the folk songs that they used to sing here when they were here in uh, kerala and uh, few other pictures how they used to dress up how they used to be how they used to look like they used to look like a uh, commoner or uh, they used to look like much different than a commoner as well um the, gra the gravestone that you see is uh, uh is one of the kabbalist one of the famous kabbalist in cochin community uh, Na namia mota um this gravestone has a huge significance because uh the graveyard which was there right next to the paradisi synagogue was uh, was captured by a lot of locals uh because it was unused uh, they felt that there was nobody who would take responsibility so people started building their houses and everything uh on graveyard they destroyed the gravestones and everything but this particular gravestones were, was not able to be destroyed by anyone till date uh because the either the person who tried to destroy it used to fall sick or die or something or the other used to happen because of this uh, uh because uh, they were trying to destroy it and um, many of uh, them don't know about this graveyard or the gravestone that uh Uh, as you see in the picture and uh, now the hindus the muslims the christians a lot of them have a lot of respect they light candles every day uh, during uh, um, fridays and the other days as well as uh, you guys requested a uh, few other pictures of kerala and how the place looks like kerala mostly everybody do, uh, like we say that it's god's own country because of its greenery because of its water uh, there there are hill stations there are beaches there are uh, uh, backwaters backwaters are like the small lagoons that as you can see and also the uh, uh chinese fishing nets which is right next to the uh, matanjari synagogue in fort cochin area uh this was the technology brought by the chinese to here and uh, one of the festival that we usually celebrate like whether it's hindu muslim christian jews uh anyone in kerala celebrates a festival called onam it's a very colorful festival where we uh lay a flower carpet and we have a, a huge hearty meal on a banana uh, leaf and uh, we have snake boat races we have the lion dance um and a lot of other cultural programs during the 10 day uh, uh um, long celebration the onam celebration it's a harvest festival and also a mythical a uh, story is there behind where the one of the maharajas of kerala uh, who was a demon but at the same time he was a kind of hearted demon um, who left kerala uh, who were asked who was asked to leave kerala and were allowed to visit once in a year so when he came this huge fest this is the this is how we welcome him so he, yes um leia over to you if you have any questions or queries you can um uh...
Well, I'm uh, sure people have a, a plenty of questions. We're actually going to save them towards the end, if that's okay. Um, I'd love to, if you're ready, uh, share your father's video. Yeah, sure. I will share the share my father's video as well. Um, why don't, as you're setting that up, uh, how about I go ahead and read the bio that you'd sent? Um, yeah, sure. Great. So he, uh, unfortunately, I caught him just an hour short. He had to go into work this morning. We were going to have him speak, um, especially after you see this video. You're going to wish he was able to make it. So I'm, I'm really sorry that we weren't able to make that happen. But so Elias Josephi Babu was born and raised in Kerala, Cochin, India, where his family is one of the last remaining Jews of this ancient community in India. He finished his studies as a mechanical draftsman and runs a business of horticulture and pisciculture. His passion is to keep the history of Cochini Jews as it is, and his role in passing on the history of Cochini Jews is commendable. He is the caretaker of one of the synagogues in Kerala, Karavum Bagam. Did I say that correctly? Okay. Yes, Karavum Bagam. Okay. Um, synagogue Ernakulam. Um, and with that said, so yes, why don't we go ahead and see this video? Uh, um, we can't hear the sound. How about I, um, do you see in the upper hand corner, it, you can click optimize video and also share sound. Just give me a second. Okay, great. Optimize video, um, full screen video clip. That's what you are saying? Yes, um, correct. Yeah. If you go to the correct. top, you should, and then it'll say share sound. So can I go ahead and try on my end real quick? Yeah, sure. Okay, cool. Let's try this again. Please let me know and wave if you can, uh, Leigh, if you can just let me know if you can hear the sound. Sure. 101 India. Yeah, we can hear. Okay, perfect. family came from Baghdad 2000 years back and Baghdad the city was built by the Jews they were slaves our ancestors were slaves in Babylonia they escaped and came together I still remember my childhood why I was uh, my Barmiswa on this and my father was Azan I mean Shabbat we how we played over here I we uh, I mean, did the rituals over here still it's haunting me I lost everything This synagogue was built in 1200, renovated in 1700. This synagogue has the only one golden seven in the whole world. Now it is Navatim in Israel. In 1940, the creation of the state of Israel, Aliyah started, the migrants started from India. And 1972, the synagogue was empty because no minyan, no prince, there is no prayer. So since there is no money for the synagogue to keep a security or anything like that, I, I took the security as myself. I used to stay in this synagogue. I used to look after the synagogue. For my livelihood, I have started this small nursery and uh, aquarium. Torah says there are 535 laws to maintain by a Jew, which we cannot. Now I am Shabbat, I cry in my heart. It's a festival, I cry in my heart. Because there's no minyan, there's no Jewish people life over here. That's why I send my children, I want my children to go back to Israel. 
to be as a Jew. For there, there's no future in Cochin for as a Jew. After me, who will take care of the synagogue? We are on the process of making an international trust for the upkeep the synagogue. It should be, be the symbol of the Jewish heritage who have been contributed towards the community. And the future, I want to make a museum in the backside and synagogue inside as it is. Anyone who comes to Cochin, they can pray the synagogue and they will get the blessings from the Almighty. Because for the last 800 years, it was here in this synagogue, prayer was there. I can feel the vibration of the people who have prayed over here for say, hundred years, hundreds of years. Well, I have to say your father's commitment and dedication to the synagogue is really beautiful. And I bet he's also so proud of you as well, um, continuing, you know, in the generations of really supporting and helping, you know, build upon the Jewish community. Thank you so much, Leah, for sharing about the history so in depth and, um, you know, again, I'm sorry your father wasn't able to make it, but it's such a beautiful video. So um, if you guys could just hold off, um, you know what, I actually, it's, if it's okay, I'm going to open it up to two questions and then we're going to go on and hear from um, Abhijit. But in the meantime, let's just get one question if anybody has one, one or, one or two for Leah. Ivy. Um, yes, hi. I just wanted to ask, one of the pictures that you showed of all the women, it was like a group, they were all wearing plaid skirts. Do the plaids represent anything? No, it does not represent. It's just a colorful uh, way of them wearing it. Thank you. I know somebody asked, why did so many Jews leave? Because as uh, everybody knows, everybody says that we have to return back to our own land, uh, which is uh, Yerushalayim, Israel. So that's why everybody left and they found that there are better opportunities there in Israel. So they wanted to return to their own ancestral land. That's why. Okay. All right, I think we have time for maybe one more if somebody has one. Yes, I do. Uh, somebody asked me, do I have uh, siblings? Yes, I do have an uh, older sister. She lives in Kaifa. She just delivered a baby boy last month on 25th. Wonderful. And then last one, Rebecca and Leonard. I saw a film a while back and apparently, I, I think it was in Kerala, one of the traditional occupations for the Jews was to press oil from linseed, maybe, uh, you know, some kind of vegetable oil. I just wondered if uh, I have the right place and if any of that still continues. Uh, that is in uh, Mumbai. It, it's in Bene, it's from the Beni Israeli community where they used to press oil. They used to know. They used to be known as the Shenivar Pelis. Since they used to not work during uh, Shabbat on Fridays, uh, Friday evening to Saturday evening. So that was the main occupation by the Jews in uh, fr from the Beni Israeli community in Mumbai. All right. So why don't we go ahead and Leia? Um, do you have time to stick around, or do you need to get going? No, no. I have. I have time. Okay, great. So um, why don't we go ahead and go from Cochin to Delhi, um, where Apijit is located right now. Thank you so much, Rosanna, to, for making the connection. 
he is, um, he works with CETA, the general manager, one of the largest and most successful travel companies in India, and has worked with several uh, different Jewish communities, including the Jewish Federation. What was the program? The Lion, was it Lions of Judah? Uh, well, that's the Prime Minister's Council, the latest one, which we have done last year. So that's called uh, the people were uh, the members of Prime Minister's Council and uh, Pink David uh, Society. Okay, gotcha. Well, so I just, I just want to say, um, it's been such a pleasure to connect with you and, and learn your extensive knowledge about the Jewish history. Um, there's something very interesting. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. Is your faith uh, Hinduism? Yes. Um, it's just so interesting because when you're a tour, uh, a tour operator, you're also in many ways a historian and to serve the communities and also because of your passion for India, you have such an in-depth knowledge. And I, uh, when we talked to you, I actually feel like I learned a lot about kosher food from you. Um, but, uh, but so, yeah, I just wanted to take the time to turn it over to you to hear about some of the work that you've done with the Jewish community. If you could talk a little bit about the Jewish community in Delhi, and then we're going to move along to hear about the Taj Mahal and a few pink city and a few other areas. So why don't I go ahead and turn it over to you um, and let me know when you'd like me to share that video that you had sent to me earlier. Uh, yeah, sure. That you can share when, uh, when I'm talking about uh, the Agra in Jaipur, perhaps then you can okay. play it on the background. Perfect. Yeah. So, so good evening, everyone. Uh, uh, so I'm uh, Abhijit, and I'm uh, I'm calling. It's it's in India right now. I'm from India. Uh, over the years, uh, we have been handling uh, various uh, groups and uh, people coming from the community. So one of the things uh, that we always believed in is when we are handling these programs to understand the nuances and understand the the, the customs and the requirements in depth, so that we can uh, deliver deliver the services accordingly. And so it led me to uh, understand the religion and uh, read a little bit about it. And over the period of time, as I started uh, you know, meeting with people and uh, handling uh, the business, uh, the people who were traveling, the rabbis and the, and the two directors who were there, through them also, I got uh, a lot educated on, on the requirements. So, so the things that were more particular, which I realized is uh, the Shabbat, and, and the kosher food. So a lot of time we, we used to have, you know, so groups used to be always a mix of uh, liberals who were there and certain times the Orthodox. So uh, the and Orthodox also I realized, you know, they are like in various uh, levels. Like the last one, which I, which I handled, uh, we had uh, the Orthodox Jews who were, uh, who will only have uh, the Shabbat, uh, who will only have the kosher meal and uh, nothing else all the days. So for them, it was, for us, it was uh, a challenge <clears throat> because uh, kosher meal is not readily available across the country. So we had to get a provision for it and ensure that every day we get a fresh supply for the next day meal. And there were a certain uh, rules that were being followed of uh, not heating them in the ovens and uh, on microwaves and, you know, and the, the plates and cutleries and all those things. Uh, the other thing that we, that was always uh, interesting and yet challenging was on, uh, doing the kosher food uh, over the Shabbat. So usually we try to do it in Bombay because Bombay had a better facility and uh, there's, a, there's a big kitchen. So it was always helpful to get fresh food and they were always, uh, the Chabad house was always uh, available to help us in uh, organizing the food. So anytime, even if you are doing at the hotel, the Chabad house, like last time when we did it, they were very kind enough to prepare the food at their uh, kitchen and then bring it over to the hotel where we organize for a separate room uh, where all the foods were then heated up and then served to, to the people out there. Otherwise, if uh, anywhere, if the group is traveling and it happens that they are not in a city where there is a synagogue or a kosher meal is not uh, available, then we organize for a pescatarian meal uh, out there. So, so, and there are, depending on, depending on the people and depending on uh, the level of their, uh, the, the faith and the requirement that is there. So, there are a whole lot of, uh, you know, including advising the hotels on, on the on the room service in the evening on a Friday to to having the rooms on the lower floor so that people don't need to travel on the elevators to 
you know, to organizing, to ensuring that the hotel, if it is in a city where uh, there is a synagogue, to ensuring that the hotels are near to the synagogue so people don't need to travel too long. They don't need to walk too long as, you know, as people can't travel on any other means of transport, it has to be walking. So a lot of these things have to be looked into or we look into when we are organizing these programs. And, and you've worked with the synagogue in um, Delhi, correct? Yeah. Because I have that video, if it's okay to share just the first yeah, two minutes. Okay, absolutely. great. All right, let's do this. Please let me know if you can hear it. In an ancient crowded land with wide religious diversity, Judaism has a tiny footprint. In New Delhi, it's in this quiet enclave. A small group of worshipers gathers here every Friday, a mix of foreigners and Indians. In India's ancient religious mosaic, Judaism is a newcomer. Its roots go back only two millennia. Bene Israel, the oldest Jewish community, landed, they were shipwrecked, and they came to India about 2,000 years ago. There were at least two subsequent mini-waves that brought Jews to India, people fleeing the Inquisition, and people who came during British colonial days as traders. There were perhaps 30,000 Jews across the country at one time, but many moved to Israel after its formation in 1948. Now, uh, we have only 5,000 Jews all over India, and in Delhi we have just uh, five, six Indian Jewish families. We are like a drop in the ocean. Ezekiel Malakar is the keeper of Delhi's tiny synagogue built in 1956 on land donated by the Indian government. A lawyer and retired civil servant, he's not an ordained rabbi, but for three decades, Malakar has volunteered to lead this congregation, reconciling its ancient rituals and traditions with the practical modern reality. So in order to read the uh, this portion from the Torah, you require a quorum of 10 men, what we call in Hebrew, minyan. So here, you know, that uh, we take into consideration the presence of women also. Some people don't like it, especially those who are very orthodox when they come to the synagogue. But I said that uh, we are such a small community. If I have these practices, then uh, I'll not be able to even uh, conduct the services in the synagogue. Mm -hmm. So you had mentioned um, there was there's a challenge when you do Shabbat at that synagogue because there's only one person available, or yeah. So so Rabbi Malika, who was uh, who was talking out here, so he's the he's the caretaker and he's the only one out there. So uh, whenever uh, we have a group, so we have to first ensure that he is in town, and uh, he usually gives out the synagogue only if he's in town. Otherwise, he you know it's it's locked out. So thus far, we haven't had this challenge of uh, him not being available. And uh, if we have a smaller group, then you know it can be accommodated inside the main hall. If we have a larger group, then we usually take the sideways. So this uh, synagogue is uh, not like the usual synagogues that you would have seen. So it's it's a it's a more modern one, uh, as they said, built in 1956. So it has got a main hall. Uh, which is again open from the side. So in case we have a larger congregation, then uh, we, you know, these the side doors are all opened up, and we lay down the the outside. Uh, we put in the canopies and uh, the chairs out there for uh, for the service to happen. And uh, so, and then we, you know, but they don't uh, allow having uh, food out there. So the food has to be back at the hotel. That's that's good there. Um. So you had also mentioned something interesting about the connection between Hinduism and Judaism. Can you expand on that a little bit? Uh, yeah, sure. And uh, the, the other interesting thing about the Delhi synagogue that I would like to uh, point out is, you know, Delhi synagogue is uh, more liberal uh, as compared to the other synagogues in the country. Uh, as Rabbi Malika had rightly said, so he realized that, you know, the, the community in Delhi is shrinking and it's very limited in number. So few of the things that they have done out here or that they practice out here is uh, the Delhi synagogue is open to the inter-community marriage. 
and uh, there is also no separation for male and female worshippers and like uh, the most of the synagogues in the country where there is a you know there is a female section and a male section and uh, as he has also rightly said for uh, they have they also include women while uh, reading the torah and the kadish because uh, otherwise they can't form the minion so that's the uh, that's the you know the, the more positive outlook towards the delhi synagogue and why it becomes more special and you know and it's it's a modern structure as i said so it's a it's a nice nice uh, synagogue uh, unlike uh, you know it's a more modern synagogue that we have seen so over the period of time uh, as i have uh, as i have seen this uh, seen the customs and uh, try to follow the follow the religion uh, me being uh, from the hindu faith i realized that you know there is a lot similarity between hinduism and judaism uh the, one of the first one is in judaism god is transcendent whereas in hinduism we believe that god is eminent and transcendent uh for us also you know for the scriptures are in fact uh, there is also similarity in scriptures in hinduism there are two type of scriptures we call them as the vedas and uh, the puranas whereas uh, in judaism as i understand there are also two scriptures one is uh, what is called as the tanakh or the torah and then there is uh, the other type is called the oral torah uh so so there is a similarity in that and also you know both the religions have got the elements and re- similar elements in regard to family institutions dietary restrictions designated uh, designate sacred language for prayers we have got uh, sanskrit uh, you have got uh, hebrew uh both the religions don't promote uh, conversion uh both religions as i have uh, realized uh, have the concept of creator or father figure uh in hinduism we believe lord brahma is the creator of the living beings whereas in judaism i understand abraham uh, to be the father like entity uh again uh there is also a division in uh, caste hierarchy uh, is strikingly similar between the two as i understand again in uh, in judaism uh there was a belief that there are 12 tribes uh, in the in the earlier days and that's a clear demarcation of the social structure whereas even in the hinduism we had uh, the varna system which uh, which clearly demarcated uh, the society based on the responsibility uh, again uh, both the religions uh, have got uh, have given birth out to the to multiple other religions like uh, christianity islam mormonism have all come out of judaism whereas uh, jainism buddhism sikhism have all born out of uh, hinduism again both the religion uh, from what i understand uh, follow the lunar calendar and uh, you know so and and again both the the important thing uh, the most interesting thing that i have found is both hinduism and judaism ritual objectives are very objects are very similar the star of david which is uh, sacred for in judaism is also very sacred as it's a very sacred symbol in uh, the hindu religion so as you travel across the country especially in the northern part you will find uh, a star of david uh, with a swastika sign uh, which is a sign of prosperity in india in most of the shops or any commercial establishments even in uh, festivals when we do any celebration that's uh, drawn on by the by the priests out here so these are a few uh, similarities which i have uh, which i have found including uh, including you know uh, the kosher food uh, like for the for the kosher food that you Uh, that is created so there we need either a rabbi to preside over the food or a messenger to cook it whereas for us uh, when we are having those kind of special occasions where these special foods have to be prepared there are these special set of people who are who are us usually you know they are the brahmins in in our as we call it as uh, in a society in a caste society who are uh, supposed to cook those uh, special foods that we have over the festivals so these are the few similarities which i have uh, found in my limited uh, interaction with, uh, with the people and my understanding of the religion out here great thank you so much um did you want to go ahead and just let me know when you want to jump into starting the video yeah sure uh, you can uh, so so while in uh, in india when people are coming over uh, as i was telling lia usually you know apart from uh, visiting the jewish uh, sites of jewish cities and seeing the jewish history uh the delhi agra jaipur is also uh, is is the 
most famous thing that people like to tick off. Uh, the Agra is uh, famous for the world famous Taj Mahal, which is again just uh, behind me. And uh, Jaipur is known as the pink city, uh, as it was uh, colored in that, uh, it was painted in that color to welcome uh, the, the prince. Uh, it was, uh, it was welcome to uh, Queen Victoria and the Prince of Wales in 1876 by the by the ruler of uh, Jaipur. So, so both the cities have got their distinct uh, flavor. Uh, Agra is more towards the Mughal architecture. It is more on the on the verge of uh, the world famous Taj Mahal and the Agra Fort. So, it has got uh, a different flavor altogether. Whereas when you come towards uh, Jaipur, it is it is uh, a Hindu state. Uh, and you get to see a mix of uh, Hindu and uh, Muslim ar Mughal architecture, because the the rulers of uh, Jaipur were also uh, uh, were also in the were the were used to be the, in the courts of uh, the Mughal emperor uh, Akbar. So they have the Mughal influence in their architecture and and the way of living. So the, both are two distinct things. And Jaipur has also is the first planned city in, in the country, which was uh, done in the good old days in the 1800s. And uh, you get to see that it has also got a functional uh, observatory out there, which is uh, which was created then and it's still uh, functional now. It's a solar system where you can see the date, uh, yeah. you can see the time uh, by the way of the sun. And while in Jaipur, you know, there are the city palaces, there are, uh, you can do shopping, you can do, a whole lot of things. So, so Leo, why don't you play the video and people can get to see a little bit about it. Absolutely. Um, I also want to mention when you do expand on the Taj Mahal, I have a video. Someone just took a camera and walked through. So yeah. if you'll just let me know when you touch upon that and I'll share that. Um, so let's get this started. Old Delhi uh, that we usually do in the morning, uh, the older part of the town. Uh, that's how we like to see people, get people out and have a look and feel of the city and how it is. the ceremonial boulevard in uh, New Delhi and this is our president's uh, house, the change of guard ceremony that happens uh, this Saturday. That's the president's uh, palace, the president's house as we call it. In the good old days it used to be the viceroy's uh, palace. So Agra is about four hours drive from Delhi. We can uh, either drive down or we can go on a train which takes about close to two hours to reach there. And uh, these are the old uh, market of Agra. Uh, if people are interested, we take them on a walk. These are the colorful bazaars. A good uh, place for photography. So Agra used to be a cantonment area uh, during the British time. So you will see a lot of British uh, architecture out there. And that's Jaipur.
a textile museum uh, just under close to the Amer Fort. Uh, that's uh, one of the activities that we do for textile printing. Yeah, so that's a short, uh, you know, short uh, capsule on uh, the the Agra Delhi Agra Jaipur on what we do and how we like to present. Uh, in addition to uh, India, we also have our offices in Nepal, Bhutan, and Sri Lanka. Uh, Nepal coincidentally has uh, opened up for uh, right now for trekkers, and uh, we are hoping that they will be opening up, uh, expected to open up in next uh, 15 days for regular tourists. So, so that's uh, that's what it is from my end. Um, I wanted to ask you again, didn't you mention um, that you, so you work also in, you said in Nepal and Bangladesh, where else does, is your offices? Yeah, we have our, we have our own offices in Nepal, Bhutan and uh, Sri Lanka. Okay. Amazing. Um, great. So did you want to um, touch upon the Taj Mahal or? Yeah, well, Taj Mahal, uh, Taj Mahal, as you, uh, you know, Taj Mahal is a world heritage, uh, world heritage site, and it's also it was built in uh, between 1631 and 1648 uh, by Mughal Emperor Shah Jahan to enshrine the mortal remains of his uh, beloved wife uh, Mumtaz Mahal, who died giving birth to their thirteenth child uh, over there, and uh, so in his in her memory he. He built this uh, beautiful uh, monument out there, and it has been fashioned from a white marble with semi-precious uh, Pitsudurga stone inlay work. So when you go close over there, you will get to see a lot of these beautiful uh, artworks uh, out there um, at the at the Taj Mahal. Yeah, that's uh, what the Taj Mahal. It's uh, built in completely white uh, sand, white marble. And these are what you see over here in the gate are the Petradurga, Petradura uh, artworks with the semi-precious stone inlay work done. <coughs> so this is from the main gate that we all walk through and uh, that's, yeah, that's the, that's how the, this beautiful monument looks like. So this is the main entrance uh, to the monument. And uh, from here, we enter into the main complex area and that's how the complex looks like, exactly. So we have to just walk through these lawns and then we are at the monument. I'm gonna go ahead and move it. I wanted to, just people to see the interior a little bit. Let's go here. Yeah, that's. So I guess this is as yeah, people enter now. Yeah. So these are all the inlay work uh, done with semi-precious stones. The interesting thing is uh, what you see uh, once you enter the monument, what you see on the top uh, is actually, a, you know, the real tomb is uh, in the basement of, of the monument. And on the top is just a, 
a false tomb which has been kept there. So no one is allowed to enter the basement. Uh, basement is all sealed off. So what people get to see is the the false tomb, which is exactly on top of the real real tomb. And just behind this uh, beautiful monument is uh, the river Yamuna, which uh, flows through. And uh, right now the river is a lot dried up, but in the good old days it used to be a very full flowing river out there. So, so we take, uh, usually when people are uh, in Agra, we take people at the monument from here. And there is also a beautiful place just behind the monument. There is a lawn called as the Mehta Bagh. So usually we take people there uh, in the evening. Uh, and for the ones who are interested in photography, they get a complete view of this uh, monument and uh, on the sunset and the different perspective, you get the complete uh, picture. Whereas when we are at the monument, we just get the specific monument out there. Now the complete, uh, there are two mosques also on, on the either side. Uh, there's a mosque and to create a cemetery, there was another rest house which was created, almost identical as a mosque. So when we go from the other side of, uh, from the Mehta Bagh, you get the complete uh, picture of Taj Mahal with its, uh, the two mosques on the side. Amazing. Well, um, I'd love to open it up to questions in just a moment, but real quick, I just want to ask you how you're navigating, you know, travel right now and COVID and how things are looking right now for, for the travel industry. Uh, well, right now, the domestic, uh, as like many countries, the domestic travel is happening on full steam. Uh, international travel is uh, restricted as, uh, you know, the flights are not operating at the moment. But of late, uh, interestingly, from uh, December onwards, we have started receiving uh, bookings, a uh, few bookings where people are getting on these uh, bubble flights and they are uh, traveling into the country. These are handful in number. These are not like huge numbers, just a handful of people who you know, who just want to travel in any ways. So they are uh, coming on these bubble flights and uh, across the country. But otherwise, at the moment, tourist travel isn't uh, inbound traffic, as we say. Uh, international tourists aren't happening as the flights aren't right. uh, operating as such. We are, the COVID situation right now, you know, at certain places it has, it has gone, uh, you know, it's under control. Uh, the, the number of death cases have reduced and the infections have also reduced. The recovery rates are higher. Uh, of late last week, uh, Delhi, we have heard uh, the number of cases have increased again uh, because last uh, two weeks they were, it was a festive time. And the coming week also is a festive period. We have got this festival of light uh, called Diwali. It, it is quite a big festival, especially in the northern part. So we are expecting, uh, you know, there may be an increase in cases again. Uh, but overall, in other parts, what we have heard uh, overall in the country, the cases have started reducing. Uh, Compared to earlier on, we were uh, like we were crossing United States in the in the COVID uh, count, but now again we have come down to number two, and we are hoping that uh, if the trend remains this way, then we should be you know coming down to number of, you know on reducing numbers from our area. Well, I just have to say you know thank you to Leia and to you, and you know it's really tough because people can't travel a lot of people aren't traveling internationally right now but thanks to you we feel like we've had this taste and hopefully planted some sort of hunger to go to india and when you do please reach out to um the sita company you're welcome to reach out to me and if you'll post your email address up there in case you know anybody wants to contact you but um and also get in touch with Leah if you want to make your way to Cochin and Misam um, with the Mumbai JCC. You've worked with the JCC Mumbai, correct? Yes, yes. Whenever we have uh, groups coming in, so we work with the JCC. So that's how I know Nisim uh, quite well. Because usually whenever gotcha. they are there, so I, we happen to meet with Nisim out there. Great, wonderful. So why don't we go ahead and open it up for some questions? Um, I see somebody said... Um, about, I guess, the Taj Mahal, how long did it take to build? It took uh, close to 14 years to build Taj Mahal. Gotcha, okay. And then in the good old days, uh, there were no, you know, there were no cranes or anything. So stone straw hauled from a nearby place uh, uh, ahead of Jaipur. Uh, so all these stones, red sandstone and uh, the white marbles were all uh, hauled from there. And these were all chiseled uh, on spot and then put on over there. Great. 
Um, are there any other questions for Leia or Abhijit? Rosanna. Uh, mine is not so much a question, but I, I wanted to uh, say something. You know, as much as I see pictures, every time I see pictures of uh, India, uh, and, and I've been for many, many years seeing pictures, every time I saw pictures in, in, in movies of, of India, I could never like fall in love with India until the time that I decided, you know, I'm going to put India in my bucket list. And I've been to India twice, and and then believe me, it's not enough. I need to go more and more. I don't know why some countries it's so easy to see pictures of, and, and the colors and everything and calls, but I think that India, when you see it in person, looks much better than 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 when you're seeing pictures, and, and it makes completely. For people that, 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 that have been there, I think they're going to agree with me. It's, it's such a difference to see in person the colors and the people. It, it's completely different than when you see in, in, in movie. Even the Taj Mahal, I've been there twice. And, and, and just seeing again doesn't give the feeling that when you were there and seeing in person. I've been in the evening and I've been in like before sunrise. And, and, and leave you like there is no 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 expression, you know, like 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 leave you leave you like it's it's another feeling to be there. And there are so many other places to visit, like Varanasi. It's another kind of world, and and there are so many other places to go. If you've never been there before, not going to the Taj Mahal. It's like, uh, it's unforgiving because Taj Mahal is one of the seven wonders of the world. So if you go there and go to Mumbai and go to Cochin, for example, and not going to the Taj Mahal, in my opinion and from my expertise in, in, in working travel, it's like not going to, to, to one of the one, seven wonders of the world. I think it's, 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 it's a disservice that you do to yourself. So those are my two things that I wanted to talk about uh, India and being there twice and going to continue going there as many times as I can. Thank you. Wonderful. I also want to mention Roseanne and I are working on our next two destinations. We are going to go starting on November th uh, 30th. We're going to make our way to Brazil. And the first uh, stop is Bahia, and then we go to Re uh, Recife, if I'm correct, following that. Um, so, so put that on your calendars November 30th. Um, so why don't we open this up? Um, any other questions? Leia, it's Barbara. Oh, Barbara, yes. Yes, yeah, Barbara. For, for Leia, number one, I would like to know what the word Bagam means, which was at the end of the most of the synagogue's name. Is that a Jewish Word. Bagam, no, no, it's a Malayalam word, which means area. Yeah. Okay, and then I, I would just add, like to add as a, a tourist that has also been to India, which I loved, been there twice also. Um, as a Jew, a highlight to me and most of the people that I have been with was going to Jewtown in, in uh, Cochin, and to Jew Street, the Paradisi Synagogue is at the end of Jew Street. And it was just thrilling to see that the word Jew, which means us Jews, is out there for the whole world to see. There is, was no prejudice in, in, in India against Jews. And it was thrilling to see this. I mean, and to me uh, and to everybody that I did travel with, Jew Town and Jew Street were just spots to go to. That, that's all. I, and Leah, I thought you did a wonderful job showing us the synagogues and, and uh, Kerala, because I Thank loved you. Kerala. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, very well said, Barbara. I, I agree with you. You know, the another interesting thing which I miss saying is uh, mentioning is in Delhi. Uh, one of the Khawad house is in Old Delhi, which is a Muslim-dominated area, and it's just a stone's throw away. 
from uh, the Friday mosque, the Jama Masjid. So, and every, and you know, no one, and everyone lives uh, happily and peacefully out there and everyone respects each other. And it's quite a popular place for, especially the, the young uh, Jews who are traveling into the country. Uh, so it's a uh, quite a popular haunt for them out there. Uh, another thing in, in India, um, this Barbara again, was seeing some of the different other religions besides Hinduism, where there's lots of caves and stuff and Buddhism, but to learn about Jainism, which is a major, um, uh, or maybe it's a, maybe you consider it a minor religion in, in India where they don't even kill bugs, they don't kill anything to learn about Sikhism and see their gorgeous temple. And I can't remember which city it was. And some of the other religions, there are so many major religions in India that are just so interesting that India, I agree with Rosanna, you gotta go to India people. It's a great country. And the people are wonderful too. Thank you, Barbara. Yeah, absolutely. Well, the, the religion see, uh, in India, uh, so what we do is whenever people are traveling around, depending on the city, we do take them to, you know, to these places of importance, uh, especially if those uh, religious places have got a historical importance or otherwise. And uh, the interesting uh, part about the country is also every hundred kilometers that you travel across, there's a change in dialect, there's a change in fooding habits, uh, change in the way people uh, look at things. So it's an interesting mix of it. Even in uh, between the north and south, if you look at it, the architectures are different. The the fooding habits, the the language, the scriptures, a lot changes between. So that brings that uh, vibrancy within the country, and it keeps uh, the interest going. Wonderful. All right, I would say we have time for maybe one more question, uh, one or two, Roger. Yeah, this isn't a, a, so much a question, is a statement. Uh, we were in India and visited the Red Fort. Maybe it is a question. I wonder why that's so um, under mentioned and under celebrated. Uh, we, we were just blown away by, by the beauty of the uh, of, of that, the spaces and the buildings were just incredible. Uh, well, uh, Roger, if it is in Delhi, uh, it is underrated because uh, the Delhi Red Fort is partially under the military control. So there is a cantonment area inside. Uh, so the security inside the Delhi, to get in the Delhi Red Fort is quite high. Uh, for the Agra Red Fort, so the Agra Red Fort is uh, a replica of the Delhi Red Fort and a little uh, smaller version of it. So usually we show people the Agra Red Fort, but again in Agra, it gets overshadowed by the glory of Taj Mahal. Uh, usually when people are there in Agra, uh, Agra Fort, which is also called as the Red Fort, and Taj Mahal yeah. are the two monuments that we show. But considering Taj Mahal, Red Fort always gets uh, overshadowed. Second, second it. trip. <laughs> okay, short trip. Also, there's a, a, a Jain temple that we visited that is just spectacular. Yeah, where and, I, uh, I don't one. remember the city it was in, but and this was some years ago, but just a fabulous building. Yeah. So, as, so yeah, as I said, uh, you know, if these any of these religious places have got uh, historical importance or they have uh, architectural importance, we do take uh, people over there. And, uh, and you know, there, there's no prejudice against anything. So anyone can walk into any religious uh, places. I have, uh, I have taken my groups into the, into the mosque and uh, people have traveled around the older part of the city and they have been to the other places of religious importance. And everyone just follows, you know, the, the religious, uh, you know, whatever the beliefs are of taking off shoes or covering themselves. And that's about it. So people, do yes. uh, you know we take people around in fact uh, a lot of our a uh, lot of our people like to do uh, a service at uh, at the sikh temple in the sikh temple across the world they have got these uh, open kitchen or the free kitchen service that they provide to all uh, they, they provide uh, meals three times a day so usually when our clients are in delhi we take them to this uh, sikh temple where uh, they like to you know offer a service by 
preparing a lentil or serving food or uh, you know preparing uh, bread indian bread something you know depending on the interest a lot of time based on people's interest we even take them there and they participate in these activities wonderful well i'm looking at the time i could i'm sure we could ask you questions for hours but um I know it's uh, getting a little bit late and it's also, you ha you guys have to start your day. So let's take a moment to thank Leia and Abhijit and for taking this time to talk oh, with us and educate us. And yeah. it really does feed this longing to travel. I, I know at least for me and I know others have expressed that. So thank you so much. And I also wanna thank Bernie, Barbara, Deborah and Barrett again for coming to me and your leadership uh, to get this started and again to Rosanna. Um, and uh, yeah, um, and I just wanna mention one more thing. I apologize, the next session is at 3 p.m. because of the time difference. I know that's unfortunate because some of you are not able to make it at that time, but unfortunately we just, you know, with the time differences, that's something we're gonna have to navigate, but I will film it and I will play it around that time. So, um, with that said, I hope everybody has a great rest of your night. Nisam, it is such a pleasure to have you here again today. Um, this has just truly been wonderful. So thank you again uh, with the bottom of our hearts. And also, Leah, if you'll please express um, our respect and gratitude to your father. His commitment is absolutely admirable. So um, all the best to everybody. And uh, again, please do send our best to your father. Thank you Yeah, very sure much. I will. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank everyone. you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. It's terrific. It was.